Hey, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Torah Studies, a special Purim lesson. Purim, of course, is going to be, it begins tomorrow night. Tomorrow is going to be Tainis Esther, the fast of Esther. It is a fast that we fast in order, to, one of the reasons to remember in the time when the Jews fought the war, there was, um, you're supposed to fast to ask Hashem for for the victory. And that's what the, they did. And Esther indeed, she was the one who fasted. So tomorrow is the day when the Jews fought the war back then in the time of Purim. And, and tomorrow night, we're gonna read the Megillah. And then that's Wednesday night. <laughs> and Thursday, we have four mitzvahs that we need to do on Purim. We have the, the four M's. We got to listen to the Megillah a second time. And we have to do Mishloyach Manis, that is sending gifts, two types of food to at least one Jewish person. And Matanot Le'ev Yanin, which is giving charity, giving money to the poor. And Mishta Vasimcha, uh, give it, having a meal. So our meal, will, God willing, we'll have in Baku Palace. I mean, you can uh, uh, register at ChabadSheepsAtBay.com. Yeah, as long as it fills up quickly, so make sure to do it ASAP. And tonight we're going to talk about something about Purim, about a, con a new connection of Purim, a new aspects of Purim that I doubt uh, many heard about this. And in fact, we don't celebrate that part. But indeed, there is a connection between Purim and the holiday of the giving of the Torah, the Matan Torah. So before we begin, let me just give a brief overview of what happened in Purim. What do we celebrate? So this is uh, in the time between the first and the second temple. And uh, this was um, the Jewish people were exiled to Babylon, to Persia. And they were supposed to be exiled for 70 years and then returned. The prophet said that they're gonna return to, uh, to and build the second temple. 70 years passed, they still didn't come back. <coughs> and Ahasuerus, the king, was then a king of a superpower, made a big feast. And he actually celebrated the fact that he felt, he thought, that the Jews are never going back. They're never going to have their independence again and the temple. And just at that time, there was the uh, Ahasuerus, uh, executed his queen and he was looking for a new queen and he found a Jewish queen. She didn't know she was Jewish, Esther, but the minister of Ahasuerus, he had one minister, Haman, who was a terrible foe, he was a wicked person, the biggest anti-Semite we know. And he convinced, he was uh, raised to a very high position and Mordechai, the Jewish leader, was the only one who refused to bow down to him. And he decided to take his revenge on all the Jewish people, and he convinced the king, Yachashverish, to eliminate every single man, woman, and child of the Jewish nation, of the Jewish people, in one day. And with long story short, the miracle happened, that Esther, the queen, came to Achashverosh and told him about this. And instead, Haman was hanged on the tree that he wanted to kill Mordechai. And the Jewish people were allowed to defend themselves. And it was the biggest miracle. And at all, everything turned around. Now, and yet we say, so this is in short, the very brief, the story of Purim. And that is the mitzvah to, to hear the story, to listen to the Megillah reading. And there is a connection to the giving of the Torah. 
the event of the giving of the Torah was uh, 900 and some years earlier. And in this event, the, when God came down on the Mount Sinai and he gave and he revealed himself to the Jewish people after they came out of Egypt, they had a very um, unbelievable experience. It was a pure godly experience. As we'll see, we'll read a little, a little bit inside about the godly experience that they had. So let's look inside. So it says, <clears throat> describing the, the, the event of the Sinai, it came to pass on the third day when it was morning that there were thunder, uh, uh, thunder claps and lightning flashes and a thick cloud was upon the mountain and the sound of a very powerful blast of a shofar, and the entire nation that was in the camp shut up. Then it says, Moses brought the people out towards God from the camp and they stood at the bottom of the mountain. And the Torah continues and describes and the entire Mount Sinai smoked because God has descended upon it in fire and its smoke ascended like the smoke of the kiln and the entire mountain quaked violently. This description of the, what happened then. Again, the sound of the shofar grew increasingly stronger, Moses would speak and God would answer him with a voice. And then it says, and God descended upon the Mount Sinai to the peak of the mountain. And God summoned Moses to peak to, uh, to the peak of the mountain and Moses ascended. Moses came up. Okay. So this scene obviously sounds very dramatic, but what is in more interesting, we find even more th dramatic things in the, in the Talmud. This is what we're reading. We're reading directly from the Torah. In the Talmud, there's something more dramatic. Is the Talmud in Shabbos? The Talmud says as follows. And they stood at the bottom of the mountain. It says the Jewish people stood at the bottom of the mountain. What does it mean at the bottom of the mountain? Rabbi Abdimai Bar Chama Bar Chasya said, the Jewish people actually stood beneath the mountain. And the verse teaches that the Holy One, blessed be, overturned the mountain above the Jews like a barrel and said to them, if you accept the Torah, excellent. And if not, there will be your burial. This sounds very dramatic, very strange. God is taking up, lifting up the mountain and putting it on top of the Jewish people like a barrel over the head and is telling them, if you accept the Torah, fine. If not, you're gonna be buried right here. Now, what does that mean? You know, this, it says of uh, something because of this. Uh, the Gemara says, "Omar Rabache Bar Yaakov, Rabache Bar Yaakov said, 'Mikan Meido Raba Leiraisa.' From here, there is a substantial caveat to the obligation to fulfill the Torah. What does that mean? You know." There is a law regarding 
when you if you say if you let's say you want to someone wants to buy something from you or someone wants to force you to sell you something if you're doing something that when you're coerced it's not out of your own choice so even if you find you sign everything you make all the legal documents you can make a caveat you can take two witnesses and make uh, giving them a maida and you're telling them that you are my witnesses that I'm not selling my property or whatever it is out of my free will. I'm just coerced to do it and I'm signing all the legal, legal papers because I'm coerced to do it, but you will be my witnesses that this was not done out of my free will and therefore I can, when time comes, I can go back to Beisdin, to the rabbinical court and reverse everything. So here, in this case, if the Jewish people received the Torah, they were coerced to receive the Torah. So what does it mean? They really did not agree to it. So in a sense, that's what the Gemara says. Because of that, you cannot really blame the people for not following because they, were not, they didn't really commit, commit to it. God forced it upon them. But this is not the end of the story. We're going to soon see that this caveat was remedied when? On the holiday of Purim. And we'll see the connection. So we're going to see first, read about this, the laws that it says. The following is the law in a situation where a person is being coerced to give something away and is being compelled to write a contract of sale or gifting in front of witnesses, the person must notify two other witnesses prior to the prior and declare no that the sale of gifting of this field that appears to be something I wish to give away to so-and-so is really against my will. I am being forced to do this. And there is no substance to, to the contract to, the, uh, to do this. There's no substance to the contract. I will be drawn. Today or tomorrow, I will request that you testify in court and disqualify that contract, starting stating that I made this statement to you before the contract was drawn up. So what happened then? So we said, and Purim, that caveat was changed. Until Purim, the Jewish people were in that st status. But at Purim, this changed. So we're going to read a few verses from the Megillah <coughs> of Esther that we're going to read tomorrow night. It says in the Megillah, for Haman, the son of Amdasa, the Ag Agagite. Tzoyre Kalayudim, the adversary of all the Jews, had advised to destroy the Jews. And he cast the poor, that is the lot, to terrify them and destroy them. And when, es and when she, Esther, came before the king, he, Achashverosh commanded through letters that his evil device that he had devised against the Jews return upon his own head and to destroy him and his sons on the gallows. They hung him and, and his sons. Therefore, they called these days Purim after the name Poor, poor means the lottery. Therefore, because of all the words of this letter and what they saw concerning this matter and what happened to them, here is the real relevant verse that we are reading now. 
So we'll read it carefully. This says, the Jews upheld and took upon themselves and upon the seeds and upon all those who joined them that it is not to be revoked to make these two days according to their script and according to their appointed time every year. So when it says over here, the Jews upheld and took upon themselves. What is the upheld? I can, first of all, what did they take upon themselves? They took upon themselves here, it says to follow the instructions of Mordechai, but not only to the instructions of Mordechai. They took upon themselves to, to upheld, to upheld the entire Torah, to upheld the entire Torah. So the Talmud indeed explains this, that this is exactly when they basically remedied the caveat that was, that they had on for a thousand years almost, that they accepted the Torah in a way that they were coerced. And yet when it came Purim, a thousand years later, the Jews really took upon themselves everything in a way that they were not coerced and willingly they accepted upon themselves to receive the, to take the entire Torah on themselves. As we see the Talmud says this. Okay. So at Sinai, God threatened the Jews into accepting the Torah by hanging the mountain over their heads. And years later on Purim day, on Purim, they affirmed their pr prior acceptance of the Torah at Sinai. And this is what the Talmud says. Omar Rava. Rava says. <coughs> says Omar Rava. Rava says, even though they were coerced to accept the Torah at Sinai, they again accepted it willingly in the time of Ahasuerus, as the verse states, the Jews upheld and took upon themselves. So he takes it from the fact that it says the Jews upheld, again, it's kimu vekiblu. You could say kiblu ayudim, the Jews accepted. It says kimu, they upheld. They upheld what they took upon themselves, meaning they upheld that what they had already accepted upon themselves at Sinai. Okay. However, it sounds very interesting, very nice, but there is some problems, some questions over here. Number one, why, why would God make this in such a way? The Torah should be forced upon them, forced upon the Jews. We're talking about, we're talking about the, the very foundation, the very basis of, of the Jewish religion. That's where we started. Why would God want to do this? Why would God want to make this the, in, in a way that number one has also a legal problem? As we said, you know, if you accept something, if you're coerced to accept something, it's not really accepting. When you say yes, when you consent to something, it's not really accepting. If you coerce to say yes. And number two, really, the question is also, why did God need to do this? I mean, the, the Jews were, they saw all these miracles at Mount Sinai. And when they saw all these miracles that God did to them, they were so ready. They were so ready. Why did God have to take them out and put it upon their head like a barrel and force them to accept the Torah? So this, this, is, this is a question. 
Why would God need to threaten the Jews, the Jewish people at Sinai? Besides for the legal issue, it's bizarre. Indeed, the Toysfus says the same thing. He says, Kofale in Akagiris, you overturned the mountain above the Jews like a barrel. Why would this be necessary? The Jews already accepted the Torah by saying, we will do and we will obey. And then there's another question. The question number two, what exactly happens? Okay, we say the Jews accepted upon themselves because they were forced, they were coerced. And then we said, when did it change? On the holiday of Purim. What exactly happened on the holiday of Purim that all of a sudden the Jewish people accepted willingly? Yeah, I can understand. They saw the miracles, you know, they were forced, they were threatened, and they, Hashem saved them, but this was not the first time that God did miracles ever since they left Mount Sinai. There are many other cases. Moses fighting the Amorites, the Canaanites that came into Yeshua fighting, the, the, uh, fighting and conquering Eretz Israel, the whole land of Israel with all of the wars. The miracles that happened throughout the, 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 um, in, in this time of the first temple. The Syrians, they came. And the king Yechizkiyahu saw the great miracles. So Jews miracle, had this experience of living through miracles and God saving them again and again. It happened throughout the history. And yet we don't find anywhere any time until Purim, that the Jews would say, you know what? Okay, now this great miracle happened. Now we accept the Torah fully. We don't find it. So what is it, what is it special? What is, what is unique about Purim? That this caused the Jewish people to accept once again the Torah and this time to accept it willingly. Okay, so to understand this, we really need to give a, a better understanding of what exactly happened at the Mount Sinai. I'm saying that God coerced the Jewish people to accept the Torah. It doesn't really mean literally that they threatened them that they're gonna die if they don't accept the Torah. The coercion it me means the Jewish people, when they were showered with so much love from God, and he showed them every, all the miracles in Egypt, they came out of Egypt, the splitting of the sea, they came to the Mount Sinai, he revealed his glory upon them. It's like when you have sometimes in a relationship, Sometimes you, you, you can become showered with so much goodness and, 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 and uh, you can be blinded, you can be blinded. You don't see, you, you have no choice. You cannot say no. After a person takes you out of the dirt and he gives you everything what you need and more, he knows exactly what you want and he gives you more than what you need. All of these things, what happened then when the Jewish people experienced such a, it is like us giving Hashem coming and giving them such a bear hug. So when you are unable to say no, when you cannot say no, the yes is less significant. The Jewish people, yes, indeed, they said, Na seven Ishma, we will do and we will listen. But why did they say it? They said it because they couldn't say no. They, was, they saw such great love and revelation of God. God showed them. And it, as the Alter Rebbe says, we're going to soon read, Hashem com completely surrounded them like a barrel. That's why he says it's, it's like a barrel. Just like a barrel putting on top of them, covering them from all sides. Wherever they go, they see God's face, God's shining face. <coughs> so we, when you have such an experience, you cannot say no. That's what it means when they were forced into it. 
Let's see how the Alter Rebbe explains this. Says the Alter Rebbe, this is why God overturned the mountain above, above them, like a barrel. As in the verse, his right hand embraces me. It implies a degree of expression of God's supernal love for the Jewish people. This love embraces the, the collective Jewish people. As when one hugs another person, surrounding them from all sides, even the back, so that they cannot move away and are compelled to stand, to stand there facing the lover. In other words, says the Alter Rebbe, because of God's supernal love, a love awakened within the souls of the Jewish people, uplifting them to the point where they would declare, we will do and we will obey. Revealing this light of love ab uh, from above, such as it says, I love you, said God, awakens a corresponding love from below to above, from the Jew to God. This is the elevation of the Jewish collective and the, uh, the expiration of their souls towards him. This is the meaning of overturning the mountain. It suggests a supernal love which refers to as a mountain. It is likened to a barrel. Why a barrel? Which suggests something that surrounds and overwhelms all worlds. A light so intense that it awakens a love within them. See, this also explains another thing. Something we learned two days ago in Tanya. But something else about when when what happened when the Jewish people did receive and did hear the Ten Commandments? It says when they heard the, ten, the first two commandments each time, after each commandment, their soul departed. And God had to revive them. We gave it all, all explanation in the Tanya class what that means. But here again, what are we talking about? What's going on over here? We're talking about God threatening them to, 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 to bury them. When they heard that the voice <clears throat> of the Ten Commandments, they actually died, they came, the soul came out. What does that mean? As the, as the Gemara says, it says, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi said, and every word that went forth from the mouth of the Holy One, blessed be he, the souls of Israel departed. For it is said, my soul went forth when he spoke. Nafshi Yotza Bedabwe. Now, if their soul departed at the first word, how could they receive the second word, second commandment? God brought down the dew with which he will resurrect the dead and revive them. The special dew that God is using to revive the dead, and that do was used then by Martin Taylor, and he revived them. So again, what does it mean? What is it, what is it, what is it all about this dying over here? And that's what al Rebbe explains, that the dying is their unification with God. When they want, when they experience this godly revelation, the souls came out to be unified with God. And that was, that coerced them to say yes. They had no choice. This then is the meaning of the notion that at every word or every commandment, the souls of Israel departed on account of each commandment <clears throat> spoken by God and the attendant revelation from above, their souls flew up in a state of surrender to God.
Okay. So because and this overwhelming obviousness of the choice, it was hardly a choice at all. The imagery of God extending a barrel over the Jews' head is one of overwhelming spiritual revelation and outpouring of love from on high. And now we can understand what happened. Now we understand the caveat. Now because of that, the Jewish people really had no choice. They had no choice in the matter. And that's what Alter Rebbe says. This then is the meaning of our sage's statement that from there, there is a substantial caveat to the obligation to fulfill the Torah. In other words, the feeling that stirred in their hearts to accept the Torah with such sacrifice and surrender that they declare we will do and we will obey was not entirely a result of their own choice and desire. Rather, it was an account of the revelation of God's love from on high that inspired their reciprocal love towards him. So it's not something that they did. So now we're saying what turned the things around? Purim. Purim, something else happened. And Purim, the Jewish people once again accepted the Torah, Kimu, the Kiblu, and they accepted them willingly. Now, what happened exactly then? You have to understand when what happened at that time we're talking about a thousand years have passed the jewish people suffered tremendously throughout the, the thousand years that they had the in the time when throughout the desert when they entered israel the time of the first temple they always had something spiritual some spiritual experiences they always were connected with some godliness Yes, on the, Mount, on the Mount Sinai, they had the real complete revelation of godliness. But as years went on, <coughs> up until the destruction of the first temple, up until the, the destruction of the first temple, the Jewish people always had something. In, in the 40 years in the desert, they experienced the manna coming every day eating food, godly food. They had Moses, they had the prophets. They came into Israel, they had the prophets, Joshua, the building the temple, the coming and the seeing, experiencing the forgiveness of the, of the sins every year on Yom Kippur. They would come three times a year to the temple, reveal godly revelation was there. So there was always something godly there. But then the destruction of the first temple after 410 years, that a temple stood in, in, in Jerusalem, that it was destroyed, and the Jews were exiled. The Jews were exiled into Babylon, Persia, all of these countries there. And the prophet told them that 70 years is going to pass, and then they're going to come back, they're going to build another temple. Well, guess what happened? According to their miscalculation, 70 years passed. And no sign of redemption. That triggered Ahasuerus to make this feast. In the feast, the fact that he was, he felt now secure that the Jews are not going back. He felt his the, the, ruling the world and he has with him he has utensils that are used in the holy temple and he brought them out he says look you're here you're here for good we can celebrate now this was you can only imagine what, a, what the Jewish people must have felt so 
desperate, so hopeless. And if that was not enough, Haman came. Haman comes. And Haman gives out a decree to destroy every single Jew, men, women, and children, in one day. It wasn't like Putin. It didn't take him long. He was able to really carry out, not to become too political over here, but he, Haman really was able to carry out this decree. He had a plan. And he sent out to each and every country because they were controlling and ruling each and every country. They were the real superpower controlling everything. And they sent Ahasuerus gave his seal, the seal of the king to send out to every province, every country, every city. That the people there should kill the Jews that live in that town in one day, 12 months from now. You can only imagine the stress the Jews must have felt all of these months. And the knowing that all Jewish people will be killed. But you know what? They had a way out, really. They really had a way out. All they had to do is to take off the yarmulkes, to deny the Judaism. That's it. Why do I need it? If there was ever a time to jump the Jewish ship, that was the time. Because the decree was on the Jewish people. Yeshnoi Amechad, the same Shainis, as, as Amon said, there is one nation that their, their, their laws are different than all other nations. So if you're part of this nation and this nation is going to be destroyed, it wasn't like in the time of Hitler where he couldn't care less, they would kill all the Jewish people no matter what uh, the father, the mother, or no matter how much you observe at that time, if they could have just denounced their Jewishness and they would be saved, they wouldn't be killed. And for 12 months, not a single Jew, not a single Jew entertained this thought. And it wasn't in a time when they saw godliness. It wasn't in a time when they saw gods hugging them. It was in a time of darkness, in a time where you don't see God, all these terrible decrees happening, and you don't see the way out. You don't see the, the, the you don't see the dark, the, the, the light in the end of the tunnel. And yet the Jews kept, they kept strong in the faith. Says the Alter Rebbe, had they apostatized, God forbid, they would change, they would convert. Nothing would have happened to them. For the decree only applied to the Jews. Nevertheless, not one of them even entertained an outside thought, God forbid, and instead sacrificed their lives to God. The Talmud tells us in details. <coughs> they opened, openly revealed in a weird way they did it. Not one of them even entertained an outside thought, God forbid, and instead sacrificed the life for God. Says the Medrash. The Medrash tells us in details what happened there. It says, after Haman prepared the tree that would serve as Mordechai's gallows, that what Haman wanted to serve. He went to Mordechai and found him sitting in the study hall with the children surrounding him. They were wearing sackcloth, studying Torah, screaming and crying. He counted them and found 12,000 or 22,000 children, different versions. He put chains of iron on them and assigned guards to watch them. And he said, tomorrow I will first kill these children and then hang Mordechai. 
Their mothers brought them food and drink and told them to eat and drink today so they wouldn't die hungry. How sad. Immediately, they put their hands on the Torah and swore by the life of Mordechai, their teacher, not to eat or drink, but rather to die fasting. Mm -hmm. Their moaning and crying went up to heaven and God heard their crying. At that time, God's mercy was awakened and he got up from the seat of judgment and sat in the seat of mercy. And he said, what is the great cry that I hear like sheep and goats? Moses, our teacher, Moshe Rabbeinu, stood up and said, it is not sheep or goats. It is the children of your nation who are fasting and praying. Because tomorrow they will be slaughtered like sheep and, like sheep and goats. At that time, God took the, le the letters that he signed with the decree against the Jewish people and ripped them up. He then caused the Hashverish great discomfort, as it is written. On that night, the king could not sleep. And that was the beginning of the miracles. <coughs> so Purim brings the events of Matan Taylor the full circle. Matan Teira, step one, Matan Teira, by the giving of the Teira, they invite an environment of inspiration and an outpouring of love that came from above, that came from Hashem. And on Purim, it, were, it came from below. The Purim, every Jew stood by their beliefs with other self-sacrifice. It is, interestingly, Rabbi Achai Gohan brings the story about Mar Baravina, that it says there was two days that he used to fast the whole year long, but except for two days. He would not fast on Shavuos and on Purim. Now we know the connection. He says, all Jews are obligated to celebrate on Purim with food and drinks and give thanks to God for all the miracles that he wrought, as it is stated, to make them days of feasting and joy. The day of Purim is even greater than the day of the, that the, the Torah was given. Mar, the son of Ravina, demonstrated this. He would fast every day of the year, except for two days. The day of Shavuot, on which the Torah was given, and the two days of Purim. Why well, is two days? Because, you know, Purim, in Jerusalem is the 15th day of, of Adar. Okay? So now we understand. We understand what happened in Purim. And Purim, this is what it means, the accepting. Accepting willingly. That they accepted the Torah willingly, not, not being coerced. Okay? So that's a new thing. Not everybody knows this. That this is something that happened in Purim. Yes, it's, it is a Gemara, but why don't we know it? Why don't we know about this? Why isn't it celebrated so much? Because the truth is, if you look into how we celebrate Purim, what do we do in Purim? We have four mitzvahs, as we mentioned earlier. The mitzvah of listening to the Megillah, the story of Purim. The mitzvah of giving shalach manas, food. The mitzvah of giving charity to the poor and having a meal. So the question is, why don't we mention anything? This is really an important thing, what happened. If the Jewish people received the Torah a thousand years earlier, but it was not really received because it was, they were coerced, so to speak, and they fully came to accepting the Torah on Purim, why don't we make anything to celebrate that? Why don't we, even Alanisim, say the prayer and the... And the and, and, uh, during the Amida, we don't mention anything about this. And the Rebbe explains that 
you don't mention anything about this because you don't have to mention it. <coughs> you see what, it, what happens? What is the difference between receiving the Torah a thousand years earlier and receiving the Torah in Purim? When they received the Torah earlier, they received it because they were coerced, because they, were, they had no choice. But in Purim, they wanted to do it. They wanted deep, deep inside. They wanted to have the Torah to observe and not to deny the Torah. So what is the difference when you're doing something because you have to do or when you're doing something because you want to do? When you have to do something, you're doing it. You need to make a check. I did it. You're doing the minimum what you have to do. You look in the halacha, if you have to fulfill the mitzvah, you do exactly the way it says, and fine, you move on. I fulfill my obligations. But when you're doing something because you want to do it, because you really feel connected to it, you're going to do something to someone you love, something, someone you care about. You're not going to buy the minimum thing, a gift, a birthday gift. You're going to look for the cheapest thing. You're going to look for something nice. You're going to go beyond, way beyond your requirements. And that's exactly what we're doing in Purim. The Rebbe explains that everything that we do in Purim, we're doing Mishloach Manas, giving gifts to, the, to, to friends. It's not like the other holidays. Every holiday has something you're doing only on this holiday. Uh, Pesach, you eat matzah. You don't have to, you don't, yeah, you can eat matzah throughout the year, but there's no mitzvah. Um, and uh, sukkahs, you shake the lulav. You don't shake the lulav throughout the year. Rosh Hashanah, you blow the shofar. You don't have a mitzvah to blow the shofar the year. But on Purim, whatever you do on Purim is not a unique mitzvah for Purim alone. To give gifts of, uh, uh, to a friend is showing friendship, it is really a mitzvah you can do throughout the year. Yes, and Purim is an obligation also to do it. <laughs> but on Purim, what do you do? It is a mitzvah to go out and reach out to Jews. Go reach out to at least two Jews. And people are actually doing it much more. You're sending shalach manas, and they're making it beautiful, and they're making with uh, ma uh, many people that you're sending out to different gifts. And the same thing is also with, with uh, the other mitzvah, having the mitzvah of, of uh, giving charity to the poor. So throughout the year, you also have a mitzvah to give charity to the poor. But in the year, throughout the year, there is no, you don't have an obligation to go out and seek out two poor people to give them tzedakah. And Purim, you have the mitzvah to go seek it out. And, uh, and as the Rambam says, the more, the better. And Purim, kol apayshit yad anyone who extends a hand, you give him. So on Purim, everything what we do on Purim represents this concept, the idea that we now accepted the Torah fully and willingly, and we're going to do it to the fullest extent. This is what the Rebbe explains. Says the Rebbe, the obligation, it says in Shechon Aruch, actually, a person is obligated to send at least two types of food to one person. On Purim, as it is stated, and a day of sending food portions to one another, implying that it, it be two portions at least to one person. And it says in Shechon Aruch, it is praiseworthy to add and to send to many friends. And the same thing is also about the mitzvah of tzedakah. Every Jew, even a poor person accepting charity themselves, must give at least two money gifts to the poor, namely an individual donation to two different people. Doesn't matter the amount, even a smaller amount, but this is the mitzvah, to give to at least two poor people. As the verse states, and gifts to the poor, implying that it be two donations to two different recipients. <coughs> what, 
We are not particular with the donations, the donations on Purim, rather anyone who extends their hand is given. One who is in a place without any poor people should set aside money and keep it until they encounter someone who needs it or send it to them. That's what we do. I give uh, money to, a, to an organization that feeds the poor, literally feeding poor people. And that's what the Rebbe explains. According to the Manota Levi, a prominent commentary to the Megillah. It says the idea of Mishloyach Manais is to increase camaraderie, friendship. This is a mitzvah throughout the year. The mitzvah of Avat Israel considered to be a cardinal principle of the Torah. However, the mitzvah of Avat Israel doesn't require one to actively seek out someone with whom to be kind. The mitzvah of Avat Israel is yes, be kind to everybody, whoever you come across, but there's no mitzvah to go out and, and, and send Shalach Manas to someone to be kind. The novelty of Mishlach Manot is that one is required to seek out a friend and present them with a food package, something the beneficiary can immediately enjoy. You cannot send uncooked food. You have to send food that is ready, ready to eat, to be eaten. Immediately feeling the impact of friendship. And same thing is also with Matanot Lev Yanim, the charity to the poor. The mitzvah of tzedakah is in force all year round. But on Purim, there is an added dimension. It's not enough to give to a poor person if and when you chance upon him. No, a person must actively seek out two poor people and give them the gifts. As the Rebbe, this, is, this highlights the Purim theme of recommitment. These are mitzvahs the Jews already committed to, to uphold, namely the obligations for such mitzvahs is in force regardless. Yet on Purim, they are infused with an added recommitment, a reinforcement and renewed vigor. And this is the message. This is the message of Purim. It's not how you give. It's not who, what you do. It's how you do it. Why doesn't anything about the holiday reflect this watershed achievement? And the answer is on Purim. It's not about what we are doing, but how we do it with added excitement. Yes, I guess when you do the dishes for your wife, you should smile with excitement. <laughs> and, and that is the message we take from here. The message on Purim is the connection that we receive with the Torah, with the full love. As the Shem Ishmuel, Rabbi Shmuel Bornstein, the Sachar Chavar Rebbe said as follows says there are two ways to serve God. Some serve God because they are commanded to do so and cannot get themselves out of it. <laughs> what should I do? Just to hear from people that, oh, it's Yishver Tzizai Naid, hard to be a Jew. No, it's not hard. It's good Tzizai Naid, it's good to be a Jew. If there is any way to get out of it, they would grab the opportunity for they see it as a burden. Some, however, serve God because they truly wish to do so. If there is anything in the way, they seek to remove the obstacle with whatever means possible to do the will of God because they really wish to fulfill God's will and not get out of it. A sure way to determine the difference between these two approaches is to see if the person serves God with joy, if the person eagerly 
awaits the opportunity to serve Hashem, to serve God. As did Rabbi Akiva when he said, when will I have the opportunity to give my life for God when he was martyred? This indicates that he is among those who serve God wholeheartedly. But if he does not do, if he does not do it with joy, the indication is that he's acting as if under duress, strictly to discharge his obligation. So that's the bottom line. The Torah is ours. And we all have the ability to proactively choose it, which makes it all much more exciting and fun and energized. That's the message of Purim. This is the message we go out with and Purim, we're doing, we're committing to Hashem with full love. And because of that, Purim is such a powerful day. Because of the mysterious nefesh that the Jew revealed, this called out <coughs> the deeper love that Hashem shows to us. And that's why Purim is Kepurim. Even Yom Kippur is not as powerful as, Yom, as Purim. So we don't have to fast. We can celebrate and enjoy and, and be happy. And in the same time, be in fully uh, connected to Hashem in the fullest way. Thank you all for joining. And don't forget to share this with your fellow. Any questions we can take now?